Hello, everyone. I'm Yuta Nakajima, Senior Director at Hauser & Worth in New York. Thank you for joining us this afternoon to celebrate our benefit, Artists for New York, which is on view at our new location in Chelsea and our Upper East Side Gallery until this Thursday, October 22nd. We hope you will make an online reservation to come and see it before it closes. We're thrilled to welcome the Bronx Museum's Jasmine Wahi with celebrated artists Derek Adams and Sanford Biggers for a conversation about how artists shape society through their work, as well as the impact we all have in civil engagement, especially in light of the upcoming election. Please note that this digital event is closed captioned. Should you wish to utilize this function, simply click the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The panel will also take questions at the end of the event. If you wish to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A icon. Uh, thank you again for joining us this afternoon. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our conversation, Jasmine Wahi. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess you can see us, but we can't see you. Um, but excited to be in conversation with you and also with two artists who I admire greatly, Sanford Biggers and Derek Adams. Um, since it's Sunday afternoon, we thought we would keep it casual and conversational. Um, and so as Yuda said, um, and thank you very much to Hauser and & Wirth and Yuda for putting together this phenomenal exhibition um, and for having us here today. Um, the way we're gonna flow through this is uh, both Derek and Sanford are going to talk a little bit about their most recent projects. Um, and then we're just going to jump right into a hopefully candid and um, friendly conversation about memory, rewriting narratives, um, historical narratives, as well as politics. Um, so without further ado, um, Derek, I think we're going to start with you. And I'll let you take it from here. Okay. Um, I guess we're going to put the images up. We're going to share some images. Or not yet. Well, hello. Yes. There uh, we go. I'm Derek Adams. This, this image is a still uh, shot from my exhibition at Stony Island Arts Bank. Um, I think maybe two or three years ago, um, relating to the archive, the Johnson Archive. I created a show called Future People, and I incorporated images and information from the archive within this installation of sculpture and collage and video. The sound track for this uh, particular video piece was taken from the archive, Frankie Knuckles uh, archive, which is, is housed in the, in the Stone Island Arts Bank, as well as some of the imagery for the collages that are on the wall are all um, taken from the Johnson Publishing uh, with a theme around uh, Black inventors, Black uh, product product designers, um, uh, people who have innovated um, the progression of contemporary culture through consumerism. Um, that was the kind of the premise of the exhibition. Um, and uh, the installation here is from uh, Museum of Art and Design. Uh, Mad was an exhibition inspired by the legacy of uh, Hugo, um, Victor Hugo Green and his wife Alma Green, the creators of the Green Book uh, and the show Sanctuary uh, was installed in the museum to pay tribute to them both through their achievements and designing the publication, um, as well as navigating or well, assisting uh, travelers to navigate through uh, America, this, last, this other image is installation at SCAD FASH um, in Atlanta. It's a traveling exhibition that started at the Studio Museum in Harlem. That is a tribute to Patrick Kelly through the archive research I did at the Schomburg. Uh, this particular exhibition, our artifacts mixed with collage elements I created, inspired by the material in the archive, uh, which is an ongoing uh, project and body of work. <clears throat> and this is a continuation of my interest in the Green Book as a point of reference for the installation where it's at that's currently installed at the Columbia uh, University um, Gallery in Harlem, Triennial Exhibition. And this 
installation. Uh, we came to Party and Plan, uh, currently at the Hudson River Museum, uh, inspired by notions of social activism and social, um, social engagement being um, one um, and the same um, relating to the Black community, thinking about how politics and social engagement has played a major role in the progression of ideas dealing with political activism. Um, and so this exhibition ends actually today. And this is a traveling exhibition that was part of the Hudson River Museum called Buoyant, uh, starting from a body of work called The Floaters, which again um, is a tribute to the history of Black leisure, which is something that is not always looked at as a political or resistant act in American society, but I think it's a very significant part of the replenishing and the, um, the ability for Black America and Black people in general to rebuild uh, mentally uh, and physically. And so I, I, I strongly believe that this particular body of work, which I started in 2015, is kind of a tribute to the aspect of Black culture that I feel goes um, under-recognized as being as, um, as radical um, as some of the other aspects of Black culture that exist within systemic racism and um, oppression. I think that the reflective nature of life really talks more about the multidimensional experience of Black bodies in America. And I think leisure is something that we as Black people don't always consider as being as radical because it, it's really about fun and having um, a space, a safe space to really reflect. But I think that this is a much necessary um, space to occupy as you build and, um, and unite. And this is an installation commission um, for the Harlem Hospital Children's Ward. I was commissioned to make a wallpaper design for a group of uh, I guess examining rooms for the hospital that was recently installed uh, this month. And it's called How I Spent My Summer. Um, this is a grouping of images of artists who were invited to participate in a drawing show at Gladstone Gallery. And in the far right corner is a drawing collage, crayon collage I created with a small series of suite of drawings that are um, individuals laughing. Um, and I think there's another image as a close up uh, of this work. And it's a series of four images. This is one out of the series, uh, a male figure laughing, <clears throat> which is going in line with a lot of my other work that relates to the idea of humor dealing with humor in the face of adversity and how that also is a human um, response to uh, devastation and trauma, but how it does not negate the ability to move forward or to react to oppressive structures, but also a defense mechanism to deal with oppressive structures. <clears throat> and so this series is called Life of the Party, um, which was a small, uh, small just project. Uh, and this is currently an artist for New York at Housing and Worth. This is um, part of the series of floaters. I just want to say this is one of my fun. favorite floaters. Yeah, he's having fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's having fun. He's caught in a moment. <laughs> um, I think, is there one more slide? That might be the last one. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you some questions, but before we go, actually, before I jump to Sanford, um, you do have a show up right now and that's the show at SCAD, correct? Yeah, SCAD Fashion Atlanta. Great. And that's up for a bit longer. Um, so for those of you who might be in the area or want to check it out, I would encourage you to visit SCAD's website to get more information. And now... I'm going to turn it over to Sanford, um, whose show is currently up at the Bronx Museum Code Switch, um, and let you take it away. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, 
welcome for those who are attending and I'm very happy and honored to be here with my good friend Derek and with Jasmine and Yuta and the crew and to talk to you about complicated issues on this Sunday afternoon. Um, the one piece you're looking at right now is actually a bronze figure. It's part of my BAM, B-A-M series, which I started a few years ago in response to the ongoing um, and repetitive imagery of black, black people being accosted, murdered, um, and brutalized by the police. Um, and the project itself was taking African sculptures from various countries in Africa, um, dipping them in wax, so, sort of to veil them, because in the belief of power objects, the more powerful the object is, the harder it is to recognize, or sometimes it's even invisible to normal viewers. Um, so I would dip them in wax, and then I would take that to a shooting range and then sculpt those figures through ballistic um, tools. In other words, guns of various calibers, 22s, 9 millimeters, shotguns, and so on. And I would shoot those figures, and there are you know videos of this process where you can actually see the bullets piercing the body. And then I would take those remnants and then cast them in bronze as a way of memorializing specific victims. And each piece is named after a victim. So there's uh, for Tamir, for Michael. In fact, for Tamir is one of the objects that's in um, the show up at Hauser and Worth right now. Um, this is the first one. This one was for Michael Brown, and this is literally called For Michael. And um, it's a very difficult project, as you can imagine, because I'm in some sense desecrating these objects. But in the process of bringing them back in bronze is actually a way of memorializing and fortifying the memory of these victims. Um, and this particular one, Michael, um, was recently viewed in St. Louis, where I had a long conversation with uh, Michael Brown's mom to sort of bring the idea back home so this object didn't just land in St. Louis without her knowing about it, but actually for her to understand the process and the uh, concept behind these objects and um, for her to have the ability to say, you know, one way or the other, if how she felt about it. And she said she was surprised and honored that I would remember him. And, you know, in this way, and I told her that I'd never, ever forgotten or stopped thinking about him for the, from the moment that I was introduced to him, unfortunately, through the videos that we saw of him being killed. Um, and this also was done in a much larger format in nine feet that is now at the Equal Justice Initiative Museum in Alabama, which is also uh, a museum that is talking about the entire history of the Jim Crow South and abduction from Africa and the history of enslaved people and the Jim Crow South and the prison industrial complex. Uh, this is another figure from that series. This one is called the Seated Warrior. This one is not named after a specific victim, but this is actually the sort of uh, matron saint of all of the figures. So she is the protector. She is the warrior goddess. And you can see that she has been injured and abused, but she still stands strong and oversees all the smaller um, icons that were made in this process and in this project. Um, yes, uh, so this is um, this piece right now. This is called Mandala of the Bee Bodhisattva. And I did this project in conjunction with the artist David Ellis um, back in the early 2000s. And this was um, an extension of a project that I had already been working on where I was making mandalas out of hand cut rubber tiles and then taking those mandalas and taking them basically to international breakdancing contests where um, various dancers from all over the world, because a little known fact, breakdancing is still very popular in a lot of countries. Um, and this is you know, also um, one of the legacies of hip hop becoming an international phenomenon that breakdancing is still one of those um, cultural st um, stayovers from that, from that moment. And we would put a video camera above the dance floor so that we can see all of the dancers doing their circular motions that echo the circles in the pattern of the dance floor. Um, and in this period, I was really considering spirituality, transformation, and syncretism, and looking at that as a way of bringing in aspects of Black culture into an international format, devoid of specific politics, but more so about the energy and spirituality in um, you know, Black cultural practices. This piece is now on view in the Bronx in the Code Switch show. And it's included there because this really was the beginning of my foray into pattern-based works where I was interested in sacred geometry, pattern and obeisance and um, 
honoring the divine through the use of pattern and rhythm. This piece uh, is called Vex. This is also in the Coat Switch show in the Bronx. And this is sort of where that pattern-based interest um, started to be translated in my use of antique quilts that I started collecting. Sometimes I'd receive them by donations, but all of these quilts basically are pre-1900. And I would do artistic interventions directly on the surface. So in this particular one, there's the quilt, but I've also um, sewn in a lotus icon, which you see in the upper left corner, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Below that, you might see a silhouette of uh, a man with his elbow cocked up looking forward. And in this case, it looks like, you know, per, you know, maybe a person looking over their land, but that silhouette is derived from a famous Library of Congress image of a man that they've called Gordon, the slave, which was a picture, if you see the full picture, it's of him with all the lashings and scarification on his back of being repeatedly whipped because he repeatedly escaped um, from the plantation that he lived in. Um, so in this sense, I've taken the image out and portrayed the silhouette. And to the right is a bonsai that I've made out of tar and oil stick and glitter. And it's very hard to see, but there's actually a QR code on this one that if you put your phone to it, and when you go to the museum and see the show, you can do that. And it will take you to a video component that relates to this. Uh, this image is called uh, a higher form of chess, and this is a combination of taking a figure from my BAM series. This one happens to be covered in tar and glitter with a little bit of a uh, quilt fabric on the uh, left side of the figure. And the backdrop is a quilt, the back of a quilt piece uh, where I did an intervention with fabric and created this optical effect that if you stand in what I call the sweet spot, which is the view you see right now, there is an optical illusion that happens. Once you break that point of view and leave that sight line, the whole thing falls apart and you start to see the three-dimensional figure and the intervention on the quilt. But once you get in that sweet spot, it coalesces into a solid uh, installation. Uh, this particular piece is called Bonsai and it is spray paint, acrylic, oil stick, found fabrics, and multiple quilts that are sewn together to create this uh, larger format. So it ends up being more like a mural than a single quilt. Uh, this piece right here is called Lakawan, and it is named after the uh, Greek priest, um, the, I'm sorry, um, Roman priest, the Lakawan, named Lakawan, who was basically punished by Athena, who was protecting the Greeks. Lakawan was war warning the Trojans about the um, upcoming invasion. Of course, the Trojans disregarded that message, but Athena, who protects the Greeks, punished Lakawan by killing his sons. And that created an artwork that has been called the greatest um, sculpture in history, where it depicts Lakawan battling these serpents that are killing his sons. And in this case, I replaced all of that information by using Fat Albert, uh, Bill Cosby's uh, animated character, who basically acted also as um, the messenger. He would message to people in the hood about the dangers of violence and gang violence and all the atrocities that could potentially happen. He was the person saying, don't do that. He was the moralistic voice. But due to the transgressions of his creator, Bill Cosby himself, you see this particular figure laying prone, shot down as if he had been shot in his back. And what you can't see from the still image is that this is on a pump. So it's actually deflating and inflating very slowly as if he were taking his last breath. And instead of referring to this as Fat Albert, I prefer to talk, to about, uh, talk about it as Fatal Bert. Um, this particular image here is also part of the quilt series. This is on view now at the Bronx Museum. And this is called Reconstruction. And it is the reconstruction of an American flag quilt. So I've made it into a three-dimensional object that rests on the wall. So it's a, a relief piece. But um, as the name connotes, it's a reconstruction of the actual materials. And it also refers to the reconstruction. Uh, this is part of a more recent body of work. These are called chimeras. These are all marble pieces that are combines. They're combinations of Greco, Roman, European sculptures, um, neoclassical sculptures, 
infused with African objects. And this particular one is called the Ascendant and it's done in pink marble. And you're seeing sort of um, a, a familiar trope in marble sculpture, sort of an Aphrodite type of figure that has a Benin object on top. And that Benin figure um, is the bust that's on top. And this series, although there are a lot of political and historical undertones, the way I approach it as an artist is really about gesture and beauty and sort of the initial impetus behind figurative sculpture um, from bronze and marble and so on. So it's really going back into classical sculpture, but it has undertones that are much more highly charged. This is also from that series. This piece right here is overstood. And this is a single piece of dual sided sequin fabric up against the wall. It stands around 12 feet high. And the depiction are of four Black Panthers delivering a speech in 1968 or 1969 in Berkeley, California at a rally. And they are overseeing these African figures that I made myself in the studio that are covered with tar and glitter. So um, we often refer to those objects as power objects. And the way my mind works, I'm thinking if these are power objects, what would be their aura? What would, be, what would they project? So in this case, you look at the objects and the shadow that comes off the objects are of these elders, these Black Panthers who are overstanding there, have overstood the politics of America and our position as African-Americans in this country. And as you walk close to it, because it's so high, they are actually looking down on you as elders. Um, this particular piece is uh, Blossom, which is in the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. And it's an uprooted baby grand piano with a tree growing through it. And as you walk closer to it, the piano starts to play, the key starts to move, and it plays my own personal rendition of the famous American songbook standard, um, Strange Fruit. These are also from the Chimera series. These are in black marble. And the face, the bust, is a combination of a Luba and a Maasai sculpture fused together on the body of Zeus, Zeus from the Parthenon. And this is the lotus piece that I referred to earlier. And this is a seven and a half foot diameter glass disc and etched into the glass. Um, if you look at the image on the right, it looks like an eye or an iris or a lotus blossom. But the closer you get to it, you realize that the petals of that lotus blossom are cross sections of slave ships. And these are derived from slaving manuals that show how to best pack human cargo from Africa to the Americas. Okay, and that brings us to the first image. So I think we can move on. Thank you so much. And Sanford, you actually have a show opening on the 30th in the city. Um, yes, in, in Chelsea at Barrett. Sure, and um, the show will be opening on October 30th at Marianne Boski Gallery, and it is called Soft Truths. And it will be um, a collection of new Chimera marble sculptures, as well as some new quilt-based sculpture. Um, um, artworks. Um, so it's a combination of both of them. Fantastic. Um, so I think we can stop screen sharing. Thank you. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, I want to start with a question for both of you, actually, because um, you both have work that is steeped in histories and historical narratives. Um, and so as a curator, I'm always particularly interested in the ideas of storytelling and how we approach audience through storytelling and historical narrative. Now, in institutional spaces for decades, maybe longer, um, really since the beginning of museums and art institutions, publics have been presented with primarily, I would say, Eurocentric and through a hegemonic lens. Um, and I would say the same, you know, someone who was trained in art history, the same goes for art history. It's predominantly Western centric until fairly recently. Um, both of you create work that not only disrupts some of our understandings of the types of histories that we learn, maybe in grade school or even um, throughout our upbringings, and you disrupt them and then present new narratives. Um, can you both each talk a little bit about the idea of revising history outside of the frameworks that we're used to seeing them in? And then um, kind of what 
that means how you recreate those narratives in a way that's still legible and approachable by audiences. Um, I'll start with you, Derek. Um, well, for me, art making has always been, uh, st uh, always started for, from first person versus looking uh, at Western ideologies or, um, or histories necessarily. Not that I don't think those histories are significant or important, but I learned at a very young age in undergrad that the power of colonialism, starting from the, the Catholic church, was to omit other cultures for the sake, for the sake of showing the, unimport, the unimportance of them. Right. And through that visual um, uh, restraint, of presenting other ideology through visual narrative, you actually empower the people you want to empower to believe that you are the dominant image, imagery. And so from that, when I first discovered that from art history, I realized as an artist that we basically have this position of being a magician and a magician, basically you conjure up images that you want people to focus on and to meditate on. And so from there, I just started to think about my role as an artist and my ability not to ignore the ideas of Western culture, because once you are indoctrinated into the Western canon of academia, you cannot necessarily be divorced from it, but you can spend your life trying to. And so right. for me, it's about trying to focus primarily on myself as first person as a way of communicating ideas of prominence and dominance a visual culture that has been um, inserted from the African experience into the world that has forced us as people not to consider it as the dominant language because of the oppressive structures that exist around it. But in all actuality, we're forced to look at black culture around us all the time um, because it's everywhere. But you know, even when it's presented to us through a commercial uh, venue like a you know like a beauty supply store mm -hmm. like, although you know ownership does not always have to do with commerce ownership could do with influence and so my focus has always been on how we have influenced the world through our actions through our aesthetics and I think those things have been the driving force for my practice as an artist for some time because I'm also becoming reacquainted with some of the histories that I was not taught necessarily in school and so for me, it's about a discovery and, a, and it's about my position as an artist to, to make those discoveries primary in the world that people see visual culture and the influences that it has had on the world overall. So I just focus more on, my work is really about presenting to the audience my discovery and mm -hmm. my discovery of things that I think are important and things that I think that we are even taught to overlook because of its aesthetic principles that comes with ease to us to create. But things that come with, cre with ease to create does not come with ease to everyone. And sometimes I think that we as a group have to come to the understanding of that within our practice that a lot of things that we do that are ceremonial or just do out of routine can also have a level of complexity that me as an artist can draw out of into my work and put it into the world. And it may not necessarily be shocking or riveting, but it's reflective. And I'm really focused on the idea of reflective uh, histories that right. are presented back to the viewer in a way for you to study it and look at it as being um, um, significant and, and critical to understanding in cultural influences that have spilled out from one small cultural group into the world. And so I'm really always thinking about those things and thinking about my work as a time capsule for the future of younger people to look at and to uncover and see themselves in a position of power versus a victim of a, a, a place of victimization. Even though those histories are really significant for them to know as well, but I think that we all have to play different parts in the game right. of knowledge and wisdom. We all can't be the same, we all can't go through the same route are presenting ideas. We all have to take on areas that are not necessarily covered in order for us 
people to get a full, um, more comprehensive um, history of Black America and the world and the African diaspora. So it's really more about looking around and seeing what is missing, what is not the, the dominant narrative and kind of taking that position uh, as an artist. That's how I see my practice. I'm gonna ask yeah. this is a question that I'm gonna ask now because otherwise I'm gonna forget even though I wrote it down, which is, and don't answer it yet. We're gonna let Sanford go first, but is it still important as people who live in the world that we live in, is it still important for us to necessarily learn the histories that were written through the lens of um, whiteness or colonialism? So I'm gonna leave that there for a second <laughs> and shift to Sanford. So you can, you know, you can like marinate on that question for a second. Um, Sanford, the same uh, first question for you about disrupting narratives, but also creating um, a type of new, not new, but uh, recalibrated history that's still legible and understandable to people. Yeah, I mean, I think Derek said it very well. Um, and we've had lots of discussions. And I think part of our agenda is very similar in that respect, is that if you're looking at museums as a repository of culture, and most of those museums, the way they have translated over time have been European, <laughs> dominated by European history, which has been an exclusionary history, then our job or part of our job as creators is to create more nuanced understanding of that. And I agree that all of that European history does have validity, but it's not the only story. It's not the only show in town. And um, part of my agenda as an artist in all of my work, regardless of the series that I'm working on, is to in interject that more nuanced and comprehensive history of the African diaspora, of Black America, um, even in the mandala works, taking on aspects of Asian culture and trying to create a more internationally appreciative view of what's going on visually. Because mm -hmm. none of these cultures exist in a vacuum. They're all a series of historical interplay. And with that being said, if we have some degree of visual literacy and historical literacy, we should be able to start to take aspects and understand different aspects of other cultures once they're presented to us. So yes, we are showing in the vestiges of that European uh, mode of display, but we are interdirecting our, I like to say rewriting history. And when I say write, I'm saying R-I-G-H-T, not W-R-I-T. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, you know, I think it's, it was a natural uh, approach for me because the way I grew up was seeing these examples of European history, but also coming home and seeing work by Charles White and um, Barnett Honeywood or John Biggers or Elizabeth Catlett and going back to school and the academy and not hearing about that work. Mm -hmm. So it was a very one-sided view that I was getting from these lauded universities and places of learning. And I realized that there was a gap and that was part of my agenda and my job to um, fill in some of those gaps. And right. I also agree that it's very important for artists to use their own idiosyncratic approaches to this because it's not just one story, it's multiple stories. And I don't necessarily present just positivity or negativity. I actually want to promote more investigation by the viewer. I want to give them just enough to whet the appetite for them to go further and figure out all the parts they may have missed or took for granted that they didn't really analyze. Um, I have a really quick question before we jump back to that side question that I asked. Um, internationally, I'm just curious, do did people recognize the mandala works as mandalas? Is there like a universality to um, that shape and figure across the world? I wouldn't say mandala specifically, but I would say circle, circular based ritual objects or mm -hmm. actions. I mean, whether it be uh, and geometric um, patterns and actions and ritual, whether it be veves, whether it be Navajo sand paintings, mm -hmm. whether it be the um, spice and sand and pigment drawings outside of homes in various places in India. Um, I, that's sort of the point. When I use the term syncretism, it's not necessarily about one culture. It's about the human imperative to represent spirituality and to direct human knowledge and, and goals we all have that, every culture has that. And I'm trying to find some similarities in that so that the conversation is not one-sided. 
right. it's not a binary. I don't see anything as a binary. Um, so I, I appropriate and I willfully and gleefully appropriate, but I think it's the intention behind that appropriation that's important. I know appropriation is a bad word these days, but we would have no art if it weren't for it. So it's really right. about how you posit your use of these cultural identifiers. Right, and I think the, the idea of also contextualizing that appropriation as a way to um, spark discourse and you know even everyday conversations. So- Yeah, and in fact, I should actually say, even in the use of the mandala, I lived in Japan for three years and I lived across from a temple, a Buddhist temple that I would walk through all of the time. And I became very, um, familiar with the objects and, 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 and sort of the spirit, spirituality to the degree that I could at that time. Um, and I was invited back to Japan to do a residency several years after that. And for that residency, I spent a lot of time literally going and having one-on-one -on -one meditation sessions with a Buddhist monk. And finally, gaining a familiarity with him to ask if I could do a performance in his temple, which he allowed me to do. Mm -hmm. And the reason he allowed it was because he literally said, I'm shocked that you, being of your age and from where you're from, have any understanding or any interest in what is happening in this Buddhist community. And if that helps get our message out, then I'm all for it. So mm -hmm. for me, once again, yes, I was appropriating, but I was also going to a source to say, this is really how I'm thinking about it. And let me know if this makes sense to you. And, you know, so that's really has been my approach since then. Um, I also, I had a very interesting similar experience in Japan, which I'll tell you about another time. Um, so to that question, and you both kind of answered it a little bit, but I'm curious, European histories are obviously important. Um, and for me, uh, in the early 2000s, going through undergrad, we were still using, for art history, we were still using um, Gardner's textbooks, which are through a very specific kind of monolithic lens and framework. Um, so I'm wondering, do you both think that it's important to know those histories in the ways, you know, moving forward for future generations, those histories in the ways that they were written at that point? Or can we bring up the same moments in various histories just through a different framework? Do we have to know, um, do we have to learn in the same way that we learned um, about these moments in history? Is it important for us to understand that or is the way to move forward in decolonizing um, art space and knowledge to start fresh? I, I think it's important to have some context. Um, I can't prescribe or predict how the information gets passed on, but mm -hmm. I do think, at least for me personally, it's very important to have some foundation just mm -hmm. so you can break that foundation down. And when I speak of visual literacy, it's exactly that. I, I think it's important for people to know those references so they don't take it for granted. Otherwise, we risk um, just replicating those sort of monographic looks at history. Mm -hmm. So it is a complicated thing. I think what we do as artists, what we do as curators, it's a complicated task. It's not just, you know, it's not ahistorical. All of this stuff has a deeper history and legacy. Mm -hmm. And I do think that's important. Although I can't predict how that information is going to, you know, ongoing in the future, you know, considering information and misinformation, how that's going to be passed down. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's really more about really analyzing the outcome of individuals in the past learning these histories and what are the effects of them learning these histories and what how and how has that helped them to progress in life through their practice as artists. I think that what is uniquely interesting about um, the creative world is that in music um, is not always considered the most uh, beneficial for musicians from various cultures to necessarily know about Western culture because mm -hmm. Western culture has also been really interested in this idea of authenticity right. with other cultures and how they have a certain level of naivete to what is happening in the so-called civilized world. But in all uh, actuality, a lot of these worlds are also civilized in the way that Western culture has not been able to unpack or even um, define their, um, the level of intellect 
and, uh, and, and uh, constructive ideologies that a lot of cultures have been doing way beyond Western culture. So for me, I don't necessarily think it's as crucial to know as much about Western culture unless you're able to um, couple it with uh, the knowledge of other um, progressive and critical uh, histories that are equally important. Because what we find in culture now, when you think about Western culture and the other creatives who occupy a space in relation to uh, Western culture is that our implementation into music um, or, you know, the idea of institutional music, art, and all those things have always been about our place as being uh, reactionary to um, being imposed, these ideas being imposed onto us. But, in, but in, for me, the, all, the, the strongest level of creativity that I've seen with rap music, blues, other areas of work is that it's, it's the opposite in the removal of Western culture that makes this, these things so powerful. So for me, I'm thinking, what if art was that? What if artists were intellectual and exposed to artists like Ed Clark and, and Sam Gilliam? There are people who are at Yale who don't know who these people are. They don't know who Ed Clark is. <laughs> they, don't who, they don't know who Al Loving is. They don't know who mm -hmm. Howard Yale is. You know? And to me, I think that is the issue. I think that those particular artists who are making work without being recognized for a lifetime are, are significant or, or even more significant of artists who are put in a place where they're, they're um, expected, they're expecting to be observed and to be uh, in a conversation of, about their practice and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me as an artist, my life is always about unlearning mm -hmm. and it is about learning Western culture because even in the institutional structure that we play as black artists, when we're, impl when we're included in a survey exhibition in a museum, our position is, is always to be a social activist in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have the privilege of white artists to show people laughing. We're not, we don't have the, the courtesy to be uh, Alex Katz. Right. Or, you know, or those types of artists who are considered important artists, we can make a painting of just people doing nothing and feel the same level of significance and prominence in an exhibition. When we're, when we're inserted in a museum context, we always are the person who's doing like everyone's job in the museum, you know, doing <clears throat> what we're doing. And until we're able to be, and, and, until we're able to have a show where we're making flowers, flower right. paintings and making uh, Sunday paintings of landscapes. And, you know, and Richard Mayhew has a dominant and prominent show at MoMA, then we have a problem. Yeah. You know, because there's no reason why an artist like Richard Mayhew is not celebrated for doing the same thing that other artists are doing, white artists are doing in the world and, and are considered masters, genius. Right. You no, know? and I, I think, think that, that I think that may be one of the reasons um, that I entitled the show the Bronx Museum Code Switch was because the work has to code switch. The work has to stand up on an artistic level. I'd love for you to come into my show and not deal with any of the politics or history. And you can do that because the work there is all about visual <laughs> seduction. Um, whether you like it all or you're repulsed by it, either way, there's a visceral reaction to it. And it's really an exploration of color and pattern and juxtaposition and collage and disparate elements coming together to make a visual whole. Um, but you could parse it together and go social, political, historical, and so on. The work has to be able, you know, for me, the work is doing all of that. And that's literally why the show is called Code Switch. Um, but I, I totally hear you. And it's funny that you, and, um, that you mentioned music because I think music has a fluidity somehow that art doesn't. And I think a lot of that has to do with class. And that also goes back to this whole sort of colonialist, um, aristocratic, aristocratic history and the, the history of patronage and so on that mm -hmm. exists in the art world, whereas music somehow can escape that on several levels. Yeah, yeah also, it, it transgresses. You know, not only that, I think that the music, because its ability to, 
to, uh, to incite so much emotion on so, such a visceral level. Um, and the, the way and the fact that it comes from a place of, uh, of many different uh, economic uh, um, levels, it, it's really, uh, un, uh, you're really unable to uh, contain it in a particular way. And art is such a different tool because most artists who think of themselves as professionals in the way that we look at art are artists who have been influenced by the institutional um, um, structure of Western ideology. So it kind of creates a system that is unlike music where going in it as an artist or a person who's creative, a lot of the confirmation you get is through the institution about what you, who you are and what you do. And music starts from um, church. It starts from singing at home. It starts from these things where- It starts from making beats on the lunch table, you know? I mean, this is one of the reasons that I'm a musician as well. And, you know, my whole project, Mood Medicine, um, although it's conceptual and artistic, it's about music. And mm -hmm. it's about that communion that musicians can have. Because you can talk to a country musician about rap. You can talk to a reggae artist about jazz. You can talk to a classical musician about um, any form of music because there is a sonic language that they all can admire and appreciate how other cultures and how other people are approaching it because they know the tools to make that sound and they know what it takes. And it's less predicated on the, the stamp of approval by you know these mm -hmm. you know colonial powers and it can be a visceral experience that people can engage in. So, I mean, there, like, once again, there's sort of a liber liberation, freedom, and fluidity there that I want to see in visual art. And I think we can get there. I think the more people are exposed, the more that happens. I'm glad to be part of a generation because all of us here know that you weren't seeing too many of us. You weren't seeing too many brown people. You weren't seeing too many women. You weren't seeing that variety 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think erasure is part of the imperialist agenda, right? And so in order to conquer and succeed um, within any space, but particularly in the institutional space, we have to be seen. And I think now we're gradually coming to that place. And um, I agree with you. I think it's really happened. There's been an acceleration in the past few years for, I think, a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just lost my, lost my train of thought. Um, but moving forward, I wonder how we can further this trans the transgressive nature of visual art and the approachability of visual art because my theory is so much of the valuation of art is particularly it's market driven in some ways, and it's not um, it's not purely about race, but it's also an intersectional uh, conversation that one thing that we don't frequently talk about is class. Um, and so how do we kind of dismantle um, the classism that remains within art world structures to um, create perhaps dare I say it, a more egalitarian approach to not only art making, but art viewing and art viewership. Well, you know, you say art world, but the whole point is that there's multiple art worlds. Right. And we are engaged in a very specific part of that art world, but there's art, there's every, you know, there's quotidian art the minute you walk out of your door. Mm -hmm. It's whether you can appreciate it and understand it on that level. And of course, there is the propaganda behind the art industrial complex that does predicate itself on class and negation and erasure and um, provenance and so on, which really doesn't have that much to do with artistic aesthetics. It doesn't have to right. do with aesthetics and visceral reaction to seeing something. So we have to parse between those different polemics of who is displaying the art and who has access to see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, art is part of, of a consumer culture, just visually consumption is one part of it, but also monetarily it's part of a consumer culture. It's also with that said, it's also part of a aspirational desire attached to consumer culture. So what you make as an artist kind of really constitute what the outcome, what the outcome you're trying to get from 
your productivity as an artist. So for me, my, my, my consumer would be a non-art person when I think about my work as an artist. The same way music is not necessarily considering all music musicians listening to your music in order to enjoy it or anything like that. And I'm always thinking about just the idea of um, people who are not as invested in the ideas of art as I am as an artist who's institutionally trained about ideas of art, history, art history, those things. I'm really interested in, in promoting this level of stability within the Black community that the aspirational images that I produce are basically reflections of how I see you and how I see us as, uh, uh, as a contributor to the progression of contemporary, modern, and ancient culture and how consumerism is a major part in the way that we absorb everything. You know, it's not, not, consumerism is always, it's not always about money. It's about the idea of seductive provocativeness. And so when I make work and I'm thinking about what I want to see in the world from the first person, I also reflect on people who are in kin to me through blood and through um, uh, uh, shared ideologies about self-reflection, self-identity, uh, empowerment. So, you know, consumerism for me is amazing in some ways because when I walk off the train, we think about art. You walk off the train, you walk in most neighborhoods, you're going to see a hair salon or you're going to see a barber shop. You're going to see beauty supply. To me, that's the museum. That's a gallery. When I'm walking down Fulton Street and I see the new displays in the window, I know most of the time those are young black women who work in those beauty supply stores and they're dressing the mannequins. The reflections of those to me speak uh, volumes when I see displays in neighborhoods that I know have somehow been presented and put there in a way to um, promote consumerism, but also to talk about um, the value of the customer, the value of the person walking by. They, they're being seen, they're being acknowledged. What you do with that is, you know, as a customer, as a consumer is one thing, but when I look, look at those things as a visual person, I see the power of the black image being projected back to us, similar to what Jesse Williams said about the idea of taking culture from us and then, you know, marketing the culture back to us. And to me, I think those things are, you know, in, in, in um, an expression when you tell someone that, that's one thing, but I think as an artist to show people that has another level of impact that I'm interested in occupying. And when people say to me, for instance, my work is positive, they're, they're right there in, lays the, the issue and the challenge to see black people um, presented without being subjected to other outside um, forces as being positive is a problem because we should not have to be uh, presented in, uh, and opposed to any other cultural history or narrative in order to be um, sustainable for your viewership. We should be able to, um, to exist in a way that we don't have to do anything. We can just be- yeah, just autonomous. Yeah. Exactly. So I feel like until we are at that place where we can, we can share um, the platform with various artists doing very, um, they're doing very unique um, representations of Black experience, um, but looked at equally, um, we're always going to have some level of un unevenness because there's no particular way to present the Black body um, other than um, the genuineness of doing that. Mm -hmm. I even take that to a material level. Um, once again, at the Code Switch show, these are quilts. These are quilts that were considered to be quote unquote low culture, quote unquote women's work, um, discards. Um, I'm using pre-1900 quilts. So, I mean, in the ethos of a patchwork quilt, I'm literally taking pieces that were being discarded and recombining them to make artworks. And that inspiration really came from seeing the G's Ben show of quilts at the Whitney Museum. Um, I had lost interest in painting for several years until I saw that show and saw it in that context and understood that these images were now being compared to paintings and they were doing a lot more for me because they were not 
um, beholden to the histories of the other paintings that were in that space. And I was very inspired by that. And I always have loved this, uh, the, the dichotomies of quote unquote high and low culture, high and low material content and so on. Um, and I would even extrapolate that in looking at the chimera pieces, the marble pieces that I'm using. The funny thing is that we have attributed so much weight, gravity and class to marble, to even white marble. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of marble sculpture, there's multiple pigments of marble that are being used but we always look at the whitewashed versions as the emblem of Rome and great democracies. And many of them are only whitewashed because the paint that was on them has been rubbed off. And the funny thing is, once again, that white marble is actually the most accessible, AKA cheapest to get. Whereas mm -hmm. the colored marble is actually more exotic and more expensive and more difficult to get your hands on. So it's a fake notion that marble implies wealth and implies strength and all of these other aspects when you start to look at it on purely a material level. Um, and that's one of the things I try to do in the Coatsfoot show and you know, any other shows that I'm working on. It's, um, it's, it's, I'm playing a trickster in a way, a provocateur, you know? And it's a challenge because, you know, I've had critics look at my work as of a decade ago and they're comparing me to David Hammonds and Carol Walker because of the limit of their vocabulary and black visual, visual literacy. So, you know, Derek, to what you're saying, for us to always end up being pigeonholed, sometimes is a laziness of the historians and curators and critics that look at our work because they just don't know enough to talk about it on a more complex level. You know, gradually I'm starting to see that get better but as of 10 years ago, it was like, listen, if you aren't hitting the same nodes that someone else hit, they're barely even looking at you. Exactly, I mean, language can splinter and people have various uh, viewpoints of looking at blackness. And I think those things should be considered um, as important as, um, as the artists themselves and what we do and how we produce and the things that we're influenced by. I think those things are such a, um, much more important uh, avenue to 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 you know go towards as as curators, as historians, as writers to look at blackness and look at blackness not as blackness as in um, black paint or you know a limited palette, or all those different things. I mean, it's not it's more than it's beyond all those things. Not saying you can't implement those things in the work, but blackness does not exist because of a of a shade. On a, on a panel, you know, those things that I feel are, you know, are being, can be reduced or can reduce us based on artists' desire to, to um, entertain um, intellectualism in a way that is not necessarily beneficial to the audience in which you're drawing information and, and, and uh, inspiration from. You know, also consider the audience, also consider who you're communicating with. I think those things are really important. For me, they're the most important when I'm thinking about audience and thinking about outcome and thinking about material. All those things to me are the driving force for me turning on my lights in my studio, you know? So I'm really interested in what could happen when artists really start thinking about the complexity of our narrative and how it does splinter into so many different conversations, East, North, South, West, you know, regions. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking about America, not even thinking about the African continent. You know, you go down south, it's like a whole different flow. You go up north, it's a whole different flow. Like, that's what I think is important. And one thing I look forward to seeing when I see an artist, when I see they're, they're from Houston or from LA or from, you know, the mid Chicago, you know, I see the nuances. I see the differences between the material and the language based on their cultural pers perspective. And those things mm -hmm. I think could be talked about more so than trying to clump us into a space of blackness <clears throat> for um, various reasons. You well, know? you know, basically back to music, as you were saying, there's regional tones and tastes and nuances to the blues, to jazz, to hip hop, to rock. You know, there's a sound that comes out of the UK. There's a sound that comes out of the Delta, you know, yeah. um, art should be afforded that type of variance. I agree. I mean, that's our history, really, you know? Yeah. And rather than clump it all together to create sort of one uh, narrow or singular monolith, we should embrace the, the inclusivity and or diversity of it. 
Um, we're actually buttressing up against time. We're a little over time, but I would be remiss if I did not ask a question about what's happening in the next 18 days, I think. 18 days? I don't actually even have lost count. Um, what, and this <laughs> totally different direction, um, but speaking of America, what can we do us as creatives and um, artists and curators, but also everyone watching out there in Zoom land, what can we do in these last critical days um, to see some hopefully dramatic change or a dramatic outcome from the forthcoming election? Well, you know, we're talking about expression. And I think, you know, first and foremost, everybody needs to express themselves by voting. Uh, I'm not here to tell people which way to go with that, but be a part of this, be engaged. Um, if you don't like what's happening, do what you can't express yourself, go vote, figure out how to do it and be uh, critical about that because obviously there's obstacles being set up every single day to make your vote not count. So you got to figure out exactly read the bylines read the fine print in your region in your neighborhood your city your state to figure out how to make that count and you also have to look at it you know once again we're stuck in binaries we got to understand in some ways the news is permeated by nothing but trump but trump is not the problem trump is the mascot of the problem right. the problem's here and he's just the mascot it. that allowed him to come out and play so right. if you don't agree with that make it count yeah I mean, for me, if you believe in justice and you believe in um, equal opportunity, if you believe in feminism, if you believe in us, uh, uh, you believe in us, right? I mean, it's pretty much a, a straightforward, you know, decision. Human dignity. I mean, yeah, it's real basic. basic. Human dignity. Yeah. If you are, if you are a person who's who's alive, who's breathing. Um, who uh, who is cognizant of your of the reality that's going on? I feel like the answer is pretty clear, unless you have some underlining, more lucivious reasons for voting otherwise. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward who you should be voting for. And and the thing that's so funny is that the people who may disagree with this idea are probably the same people who are ashamed to admit who they're voting for. And if you're ashamed to admit who you're voting for, when you're around people that you know are voting the opposite for good reason, then you should ask yourself why you're ashamed of something that you would vote for. Why are you ashamed to say it? And to me, I think that, to me- Once again, a mascot. Yes. A mascot of all of those issues. Whatever reasons yes. Shame are, included. You know, are legitimate reasons. You should be able to say it. You should be able to talk about it. And if you can't- Articulate openly, yeah. yeah. You should articulate those things. And to me, I know it's only one, one answer um, for this election, regardless of, um, we have two candidates and one is for one thing and one is for something else. And but you know what, let's, let's go, let's go, let's go even beyond that though, regardless of how it turns out, who, whoever is there has to be held accountable. It's not just about an election, it's no. about follow through and it's about right. much larger policy stuff, down ticket started. stuff. Yes. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so I mean, whoever ends up there has to be held accountable because at the end of the day, when you've got a considerable block of voters and people can effectuate change, if they are expressing themselves in that way, in a consolidated way, regardless of who's in power has to pay attention. So, yeah. you know, exactly. beyond the candidates, that's something that the community has to recognize. Absolutely. And I think to, um, to your point about the challenges that we face daily, um, this is my call to action for everyone in the audience, and then we'll take a few questions if you both have a few more minutes. Um, yes, I do. Give me one sec. I have to step away for one second. Okay. You step away and I'll make my call to action. Um, you know, everyone who is on here watching us today obviously has internet access and has a certain level of access and privilege through um, having phones, having the ability to watch panels like this. And that uh, communication exchange can go many ways. And so if there are people who are not necessarily aware about the important power that they hold as voters, please take it upon yourself to um, let them know or encourage them to check out the 
literature, which is available both online, but also even during COVID um, in paper form, um, where they can go and learn and educate themselves about not only the two candidates, um, people tend to think that the presidential election is the end all be all, but about your regional candidates, um, congressmen, senators, even down to who is going to be your next DA, um, you can find all that information and it's you know, important to educate um, yourself and your peers and show up either before or on November 3rd. Um, so that's my pitch. And mm -hmm. I think we'll move to a couple questions. Um, so, oh, I like this question. Um, Questions for both of you, but Sanford, I'll obviously start with you. Who are one to two of your favorite writers slash authors and why? And what about their work moves you? It's hard Ooh, to pick. Wow. <laughs> um, this is by no means limiting, you know, the library or <laughs> bibliography of people that I'm, I find interesting. But I will say um, there was a book that really affected me um, when I was in college by Ivan Van Sertima. Um, they came before Columbus and love that book. <laughs> yeah, right. So um, once again, going back to both things that Derek and I have, you know, uh, sort of touched on was that there is not one specific history. And unfortunately, you know, the American school system has done us all a great disservice. And this is something you should be considering as you're voting, because this is local stuff, is that they are not giving a full picture of history. You know, it, once again, it's cherry picked to create, you know, to propagate propaganda, basically. Um, so his book was one that showed me other aspects and other stories that were not taught to me in school on a daily basis, but this is the education I received at home that made me say there's more to this story, but there's more to any story than what you're getting that is getting given to you by any media source. Um, another artist that just popped um, in mind, well, there's two, Octavia Butler and Sam Delaney. Um, who I would say are proto Afrofuturist. I could say Afrofuturist now because that's enough of a buzzword where people have some idea what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. You know, but these are an incredible artist that who were looking at alternative futures with their knowledge of the real history and the lapses in history and in, in education and so on. And the way for them to express themselves and the potential that we have as a species was through science fiction. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll go with those two for now. Three Octavia, for now. Octavia Butler is one of my favorites as well. And um, actually my first, second exhibition at the Bronx Museum is inspired by um, the Earthseed Chronicles. Uh, um, yes, yes. So Derek, the question was, um, who are one to two writers or authors who um, are really important to you and have informed your work? Um, for me, Bell Hooks is, it will always be my number one. Um, and actually as an artist, I'm constantly, um, reflecting on the way that she's able to communicate as an academic in a way to speak, um, uh, in both academic and layman's terms through her writing. Um, I, re I, I visit her writings often for influence. Um, and the way that I deliver my, the, the imagery, imagery of my work, the context of my work is, uh, it's really driven by um, uh, her writing primarily. Um, I like to look at um, a lot of different, uh, Lucille Clifton, um, the yeah. poet from, um, from Baltimore. Actually her, her, her kids are opening up a, a residency in Baltimore for creators, which is really awesome. Um, and a few other poets, but I, I will I will say that um, my main source, I think, at this point, has been for a few years, have been Bell Hooks. And you any know. any specific works of hers? Um, Art of My Mind is one of my favorite books. I teach it a lot in uh, my classes. Um, I use it a lot in lectures. I think um, it's a writing that is very reflective. Um, from artists on very beginning um, stages of their career and artists who have, you know, who are also more accomplished are both able to dissect that particular writing as well as other writings 
uh, much easier um, because it uses a lot of uh, references to life mm -hmm. as first person, um, along with looking at the world critically as a black person. So um, that's one thing that I been really focused on. And I, need, and I have the new book called Driving While, While Black that I'm excited about. I wanna give a little shout out to the writer. Hold on one second. Gretchen Surin. I actually had a talk with her this past week. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to reading this book. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of different things, but they all start off based on research. Um, and they kind of go into other areas of interest, but research is always kind of like the, the beginning stages of my work. Uh, and they're always are rooted in some type of literature that's not, that's usually not visual, you mm -hmm. know, but it's with writers who are a little bit more imaginative with the way they shape narrative and shape environment within their narrative. Amazing. So, um, we're actually very over time, but <laughs> really I'll ask, I'll do one more quick one. Um, this one is for Sanford. How many artworks do you have at the Bronx Museum and how did you choose the historical pieces to reshape narrative? Um, I'm not going to be able to give an exact count, but I would say somewhere between 60 and 65 works. And that is um, sort of, you know, two dimensional pieces, three dimensional pieces and um, some video. And it, it's a very tight show because it's not it's, it's not a, a retrospective in any way. It's a survey of a very specific series of quilt based works. So the antecedents to that work that um, I, you know, the the works that I had to use historically to build that up are from the Mandala series because that was my exploration into um, pattern. Um, there's also a musical piece um, that includes some of the quilt works that um, I did with my um, with my group Moon Medicine, and you know it's, we scored the piece and it was shot by Terrence Nance, the incredible director um, who did. Um, um, well, what's the name of the show? I'm forgetting the name of the show on HBO. Um, Random Acts of Flyness, yes. Random Acts of Flyness. Um, so yeah, that should formulate enough to understand the code switch show. But of course, when you see the show at, um, at Soft Truths at Marianne Bosky, it continues on that, that path, but it takes some divergent moves. So I think a good way to understand the newest work is to go see the code switch show first at the Bronx Museum. Amazing. So congrats, gonna... congrats on the show, Sanford. Say what? Congrats on the show. I'm looking oh, forward to it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to let us all go and have a glass of wine in our own homes away from each other. But thank you so much, Sanford and Derek, for this amazing conversation. Thank you all for attending out there in the audience. And um if you can catch the show at Hauser and Worth live, um, you can also see it online and look forward to seeing all of you in person soon. And don't forget to vote. Okay. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you all. Blessings to all. Blessings.